Hi, everyone. This is Arjun, uh, founder and CEO of Workbench. Today, I have the honor of having Esther Dyson, uh, who will be talking more about her background in space, health, technology, and startups, both as an operator as well as investor. Um, Esther, thank you so much for joining us on, on our fireside webinar chat. Uh, we, we, we're very honored to have you on the show. Can you, can you talk about a little bit of your background and how you actually got started? Um, sure. So it would help to know who who the likely audience is so that I can make it relevant to whoever's listening. Is it mostly startups or artists or? Right. So most of, most of our audience would be uh, creatives, the maker community, the entrepreneurial community, the cre mm -hmm. uh, visual creatives. Um, and so, so if you can gear our discussion towards that, that'd be amazing. Okay. Um, so I started out as a journalist, which gives you practice asking questions <laughs> and then spent 25 years writing a newsletter and running a conference in the tech sector, sold my business, uh, became an angel investor, spent six months training as a cosmonaut in Russia, and finally got more and more interested in health rather than health care as a something fundamentally more interesting than helping people with Uber for shoe shines or, you know, just like I love the web, but people just have more fundamental problems than things that can be solved by Facebook. So <laughs> that's what I'm doing now. Uh, and so, and so I was reading a little bit about your recent projects, um, uh, Belleville specifically. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that entails and what's the initiative behind Belleville itself? And how would you even get started with that project? I got started with it because I thought somebody should talk about health as an asset rather than health care as a cost. And so health care as an asset. Yeah. It's, it's something that makes people more productive. It's something that gives them healthier lives. It, you know, it has an economic role in enhancing productivity and making communities economically viable. It's, it's something that's resident in human bodies and minds. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, of course, People think short term, investors think short term, politicians think short term. And so what, what's happening now in the US in particular is we're renting health. And that's not very good. When you rent things, you often don't take good care of them. And then you wake up and suddenly you're 60, you don't own anything and your body is falling apart and you have no capacity to deal with Alzheimer's, cancer, uh, just advancing age. So the challenge is how can we invest in health rather than just trying to rescue it with care when it's too late. So you're saying renting health or renting health care as no, a renting health. Renting health. It's an interesting uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a concept obviously, but right. it's you, you do only what you need to do short term and you end up with with no real health. You end up having dissipated your asset of health, lost your resilience, often, you know, created multiple vulnerabilities. Your body is no longer capable of running upstairs. It can't fight. You know, you can't, there's, there's a wonderful book called Anti-Fragile. You know, it's, it's probably good for you to spend, pull an all-nighter every once in a while and then sleep it off, but to sleep five hours a day persistently destroys you, whereas a short-term stress builds up your resilience. You said, uh, can, you, can you repeat the, the recommendation, Andy? Oh, anti, okay. A-I-N-T-I, anti-fragile. Anti-fragile, interesting. By Nicholas Taleb, the guy who wrote The Black Swan. Mm. And you know, he, he doesn't come across as especially likable in the book, but it's a really good <laughs> book. And the, you know, the basic idea is running, running a marathon mm -hmm. is really good for you. But if you ran a marathon every day and you never had time to recover, it would be really bad for you. And we're, anyway, so I thought, how do we, how do we make this happen? It, it clearly doesn't happen by giving everybody a Fitbit and telling them to show a little self-discipline. So is this is this more along the lines of a, um, a service based initiative, or is it actually a product, a series of products you're no, working? It's it's a nonprofit. Okay. 
and we're trying to show what it looks like when you invest in health and it happens in communities and in order to in order to do something that i could at least initially fund the idea was to pick five small communities and have them demonstrate what it looks like when the community as a whole invests in health in other words you can do in a small community, you can do something as collective action. In a large community like the US, you have to do it as government interference. And there, this is what all the discussion right now over Obamacare and should we tax sugar and mm. what does Medicaid pay for and so forth. So I saw your recent post on Facebook about uh, the, the sugar tax or the sugar um, warning labels that uh, are coming up yeah. in San Francisco. And I, I think that's great. But, you know, it's again, knowledge isn't everything. You need to have accessibility to the food. You need you need a place to exercise. You need <laughs> to live somewhere where you can go to sleep at night without being scared that somebody's going to mug you or it's too noisy or whatever. So we wanted to show what it would look like. And again, it, it, it's not a nice white lady from New York is here to tell you guys how to live. It was, you know, <laughs> let's find five communities that want to do this and would like a little support, encouragement, access to vendors, to funders, whatever. Kind of the way a person might say, you know, I've got to stop renting my health. I want to invest in it. I want a personal trainer to help me do this. We're kind of like personal trainers to these five communities. So we got 42 applications. This is a team of five right now. Yeah. And we picked five of them. And this was two and a bit years ago and got to work. How, um, did, you, uh, how did you actually go about picking those five communities? Is, is Portland, Oregon or somewhere in Oregon? Yeah. Clatsop County, Oregon. Again, they had to be under 100,000 people. They had to be geographically remote so that whatever you do in the community really reverberates within that community. People aren't going outside the community for lunch every day or coming in. So the food supply, the religious institutions, the exercise facilities, the jobs, all these things, they're all, it's, it's really a community, a geographical community because ultimately health is mental and physical. It's, it's not something just online. Mm -hmm. So we got 42 applications and you had to have an existing effort to do this in some form or other, though probably not with our particular slant on it. And we read them all carefully. They were long. This wasn't like send us a short letter. It was give us a lot of data, tell us what you've done before, what are your county health rankings, what are your big problems, blah, blah, blah. And we picked... 10 to visit, which we did the summer of 2014. And that was, you know, I've done space training. I went to Harvard. I've done all kinds of things. This was one of the most educational summers I've ever had. And we picked five. And then it's, so this is a 10 year project. It's not something quick. <laughs> and the communities are gathering together in Spartanburg in two weeks. Spartanburg, South Carolina is one of the communities. Yeah. Then there's Clatsop County, Oregon, Lake County, California, Muskegon County, Michigan, and Niagara Falls is now basically dropped from the program because they they weren't really making any progress and they yeah, their attention is elsewhere, whatever. And part of being accountable is acknowledging when things aren't working and not not pretending they are so you have that you have that start mentality is when when something doesn't work the mvp doesn't work you move on you iterate and you cost right and we're so we're bringing some of that but the the other thing we're bringing is accountability in general you know like you can't one of the communities wrote as one of their goals it was to address suicide prevention and i crossed that out and said prevent suicides you know it's like mm. don't your goal is not to run a program your goal is actually to foster a measurable change. And I've come to the conclusion that a lot of this is going to happen indeed with health coaches of some kind, whether it's obesity coaches, exercise class, nutritional training, mental health coaches, 
nurse family partnership where a nurse visits pregnant mothers and, and helps once the baby's born. It's, it's actually, it, it requires people. And that's great. Everybody's worried about unemployment. But and so, and so you, you mentioned people, and and obviously our audience, and and, and obviously in New York City, you know, it's a very star community, Silicon Alley, Silicon Valley, whatever you want to call our star community in general. Hiring is one of the most important things. You can if you make one bad hire, you can take away three years of productivity from your company. Yeah. How are you finding these people who are, are okay? Your so core? we're not a company. We're not hiring techies. Our, our nonprofit. <laughs> The communities need to hire and train coaches. And I think in many cases, they're going to bring in companies like Blue Mesa Health, Nurse Family Partnership. In other words, the communities have people who can be trained and then help other residents of the same community become healthier mm. by having both a curriculum, sort of a playbook, and, and having... The uh, whole, you know, again, accountability for results. It's, it's not just let's run a program. It's you actually are accountable for helping, you know, this community reduce its BMI by three percentage points or slow down the transition to diabetes or reduce the number of premature births or reduce the measure of people who are mentally ill. You're basically empowering the individual people. It's it's, uh, it's it's helping local residents and people help each other and creating a basically a cascade effect. Yeah, I mean, it's not so much empowering individual people. It's it's providing a supportive community around them. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're not tech and we're not individual empowerment. We are. It's, it's kind of, I like to say it's like cultivation. We're not producing health on an assembly line, but we are creating an environment in which health grows. So it's kind of like cultivating this living, this asset of living beings. But that's, you know, that's a serious accountable process. It's not simply, you know, again, handing out pamphlets and telling people they need to live better and make better choices because they might not have access to healthy food. They're, the school environment may, may be toxic to children who have troubled parents, that kind of thing. All right. Um, let's talk a bit, little bit about your, your background even before you go into health. Uh, so Wall, the Wall Street Journal wrote an article uh, called a, a, a Week, in, a week in, in, in the Life of Esther Dyson. Um, and I found it very fascinating that to find out that you're actually from my hometown of Princeton, Princeton, New Jersey, and, and you talk a little bit about that in there, but specifically your, your daily life of running around the city, running around the country, uh, and, and working with people. What, what, makes you so, uh, what makes you so excited about working with so many companies and people, yeah. you know, so many boards? Uh, what, what makes you move forward? I mean, you sold a company. What keeps you pushing, uh, you know, moving along? Okay, well, interestingly, I was in Princeton yesterday seeing my parents, and uh, <laughs> partly because they wanted me to... Do you remember uh, Ben Spoon? Remember what? Ben Spoon, the, the ice cream parlor on Nassau Street? Uh, no. <laughs> it okay. probably didn't exist when I was there, and uh, I left home when I was 15. But okay. they, they are slowly moving to San Diego, so they had a whole lot of boxes of old photographs and, and weird things they wanted me to go through. We had a nice time. But I mean, in some sense, I owe it to my parents, scientists, and, you know, always curious. And also, you know, asking these fundamental questions. Well, why can't we do X? What would it take to do whatever? And in addition to science, I clearly was not going to be as good as my parents. So I ultimately majored in economics, I think economics is a really important part of almost anything happening. And so, you know, what is the business model for cultivating health? How can we fund it? How can we show an ROI so people will fund it? Uh, what's the impact? You know, yes, you want to cultivate and people are unique and precious, but that doesn't mean you can't measure things. So, you know, space travel, I'm wondering why isn't this happening, or, you know, just the intellectual 
curiosity around AI and stuff like that. Uh, that's what drives me. Um, interesting. So, so I'm writing down here, economic thinking basically helps anyone with any kind of idea actually, you know, be more practical about it, not just well, be or it, or it shows that the idea doesn't make sense. Interesting. Right. I mean, economic thinking helps to analyze any idea and figure out whether it will work and then how it could work. By the way, in Workbench, are you going to put other things other than text up here, like find other articles, or how does this work? Uh, I have I have two separate articles, um, uh, and the, the other one is uh, is about uh, breaking through the glass ceiling from BBC. Yeah. And then the last yeah, thing about. I mean, do you add other things over time, or how does this? I'm just oh, this is just, this will be a static board uh, which I'll upload on Flickr later on, mm -hmm. um, and then this is basically like the uh, something a takeaway our audience can you know it's like a basically me taking notes on their behalf um, right. and visualizing. But it's not very visual. I guess that was the point. I mean, if 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 you want, you can go to my Flickr feed and add a whole lot of photos later. Oh yeah, I could I could absolutely do that. Okay. Um, so you said okay. me in a space suit. <laughs> <laughs> I was debating on which photo to actually put here yeah. uh, on the left side, but I, I I found this to be the the nicest one, yeah. the most high resolution I could find online. Right. Uh, but anyway, so so economic thinking helps any idea make sense from a practicality perspective. Yeah, but again, I didn't say that. I said it helps figure out whether any idea makes sense. Figure out any idea makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there are some ideas that don't make sense, and economics won't won't fix it. In fact, it will show it not working. Okay, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, and this is honestly my reaction to Silicon Valley. Yeah, all you need <laughs> is a great idea. Well, no, some ideas don't make sense. Some ideas might work economically, but are useless or evil. Um, what really matters is implementation of the idea. The execution, if I may? The execution, fine. Uh, is there any specific uh, experience that may have caused you to actually think differently and any examples of, of companies or initiatives that didn't do so well? Something that our entrepreneur, entrepreneurial audience can take away is that as a lesson of how to actually better execute and better move forward. Um, nine times out of ten, the problem is management. It's it's not the idea. Management, okay. Uh, so, you know, yes, the idea should make sense, and as far as I'm concerned, it should actually have some value. But most companies fail because they couldn't, the team wouldn't work together effectively. The they didn't know what they were doing. The founder mm. got into an argument with another founder. You know, who who knows what, but. Uh, it's, I'm always amazed when I get investment pitches and they don't include anything about the management because that's what you invest in. The idea always changes anyway. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Um, what has been, uh, let's talk a little bit about mentors and people actually teaching you the many, many other things that you've learned so far as an entrepreneur, as an operator. Any, any specific people that you look up to or would give credit to uh, getting you started initially? Well, I was not an entrepreneur. I had a company, but I wasn't trying to grow it. It was more a vehicle for my education. And <laughs> it was wonderful. I spent 25 years learning about the tech industry and watching people, and they would answer my questions. But I wasn't actually trying to build a business. Mm -hmm. It was approximately five people for 25 years and that was fine uh, and you know one important lesson for people is number one there are careers other than being an entrepreneur that are valuable and <laughs> you shouldn't feel inadequate if you're not Mark Zuckerberg second that uh, you know you really need to understand what your own motivations are and you know, maybe you don't want to be in a startup. Maybe you want to work in a team. Maybe you want to just have a great life being a health coach or something. Uh, and a lot of people 
you know, if you're motivated only by getting rich, you probably won't be successful for get rich. And some people do, but you know, in the end, that's not what makes most people happy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you can learn from a mentor, but you can also learn from a lot of people who are not mentors. There's, again, Silicon Valley has a tendency to get really excited about ideas that may or may not make sense, and they don't apply a lot of judgment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're excited about mentors. They're excited about AI. They were excited about mobile or, you know, who knows what. And the most important question is to ask, does this make sense? Rather than, is this the next hot new thing? And then how do you actually implement something useful? Who's, who's your customer base? What value does it create? Is it, you know, and you can, you can certainly get rich copying something that already exists and especially doing it better. Mm -hmm. But personally, I like to invest in things that probably would not exist without me and the other investors in something, you know, something that's, that's genuinely worthwhile and not redundant. Mm -hmm. what, what, besides, besides uh, being an angel investor and besides being a, uh, an investor in many companies, um, what are some of the initiatives you, you're doing outside? Are you mentoring other, other young entrepreneurs? Are you part of, I know you're part of several nonprofit organizations. Can you name any specific ones that you are very, very excited about in terms of where they're going as an yeah. initiative? I'm, I'm on how maybe you and I, maybe my, myself and our audience can get involved and help out as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the boards of a number of companies, which is probably, you know, I'm an investor in a whole bunch of companies. The ones I'm most active in tend to be the ones I'm on the board of for obvious reasons. And those include Voxiva, which actually is in health and serves Medicaid patients. Uh, okay. 23andMe, which is the direct-to-consumer genotyping company. Can you, can you spell the first one? V-O-V, -V, as in voice, V-O-I-X-I-V-A. Mm -hmm. Okay. N no, no I, V-O-X. V-O-X, okay, got it. Uh, then there's Meetup, and of we're in the Meetup offices right now. This Shout is out to the meetup conference room. room. And Yandex, which is the Google of Russia. X Core Aerospace. Is it just X? Core? X C O R. X C O R E. No E. X C O R. Yeah. And it's Meetup, even though I think I said Meetup.com. Yeah, it, it's you should actually just call it Meetup. It's Meetup Inc. It's, it's more okay. than just a website. Great. Got it. And I'm on the board of the Sunlight Foundation. Sunlight Foundation? Sunlight. Sunlight, OK. Foundation, right. Got it. And so how, so explain to me a little bit about each of these companies. I know meetup.com, I think everyone in the tech community knows that it's yes. been an impact on bringing the community together. What are some of the yeah, initiatives? Um, meetup is not just for techies it's also for parents it's for dog walkers it's for you know gay people in kansas it's for republicans and democrats and even better it's for chess players who happen to be republicans and democrats who play chess together and discover that republicans and democrats aren't so bad uh, it's it's to create community uh, 23 and me direct-to-consumer genotyping gives okay. people access to their own data and tremendously useful and also educational. Um, Yandex, as I mentioned, Google of Russia. x Aerospace is one of the leading space companies. Interesting. Yeah. X-Core is uh, what you said, one of the leading space and what, in terms of... Uh, they're, they're basically, they're, they're specialists in propulsion. Okay, propulsion. I know some friends who are definitely looking to get into the aerospace industry um, yeah. and they always talk about SpaceX. 
of being yeah. the best example, but obviously there are other smaller and bigger yeah. companies. Right. Um, and what about the Sign Life Foundation? What is their focus on? Uh, government transparency. And, Interesting. You know, which ultimately means, you know, accountability of government, uh, fighting corruption, letting people understand what the government is doing, whether it's good or bad, and data about the impact of government, you know, just the way businesses need to report on their activities, so should governments. And mm -hmm. political donations should be visible and transparent and so forth. Let's, uh, let's briefly talk about, um, not just in the tech industry, but many other in industries. Um, there's an article about you and breaking the, you know, the glass ceiling people, quote unquote, glass ceiling. Women in the, in the tech space or women in finance or any other industry, I mean, one of my investors, Brian Cohen, wrote a book and he specifically talked about how women tend to make better product managers, they tend to you know, do better at running a company. What is your opinion about the whole movement towards getting more women in, involved and how can we do that more and more in our, in many industries, not just yeah. tech? So I don't think women necessarily make better product managers. I think you should look for good product managers, whatever they are. Sure. Um, it's, it's a challenge and an issue, but how often do you ask men about the glass ceiling? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just a problem for women, it's a problem for men because they're losing access to a large talent base. And I don't have any particular unique insights. I personally was very lucky, partly because I never really worked in a large corporation, which, you know, where some guy was trying to get my job and used whatever mechanisms they had to, to succeed competitively. Um, I once was asked to be on a panel called Women in Space, and I asked whether they had panels called Men in Banking, and they <laughs> changed the title ultimately. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, what did they end up calling it? <laughs> it was just you know something like space travel. I mean, it, it just was a sensible. The panel was about space. It wasn't about women in space. And so they gave it some name that was about space and it happened to have four panelists who are women, just the way many panels about banking have four panelists who are men. But yeah, I've never seen a panel called Men in Banking. It's interesting, especially living in New York, you, get, you see a lot, of, a lot of that happening. Yeah. So, so in terms of for company, I mean, you, you're an investor in many companies. How are they actually uh, focusing on this issue, not full time, but you know, partly in terms of building a good culture, building a an accessible culture for multiple kinds of people, not just gender, but different kinds of races and whatnot. What? Yeah. How can our community build better companies for the future? Um, board members should kind of say, hmm, did we not have any female or black candidates for this particular role, and you know, I, I love Meetup because I walk in and Meetup looks more like New York than it looks like your typical Silicon Valley of white and Asian males. And I think that's really great. Um, it's a, you know, there's, there's no magic. Of course, It, it yeah. starts with the founders taking it seriously and with the board mentioning it when appropriate and, you know, who you look for in terms of your your candidate pipeline, it's, 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 there's accountability around cultivating health and there's also accountability around having a genuinely diverse workforce. And, you know, it's, it's about individual people. It's not saying women are better project managers, but it is saying when you're looking for project managers, let's make sure we consider some women. Let's, let's reach out and the accountability is not in this hire or that hire. The accountability is, so what does your workforce look like as, as a whole? I mean, you, you measure with numbers, but you create that result with attention to, to the issue and, and an openness. You, know, you look for candidates who might help you improve those numbers.
Hey, hey, can you can you name any specific company besides Meetup that is a good example of how maybe in tech, but in general in business, how a company should operate? Um, it's often the larger ones. You know, we don't get a lot of credit for it, but Xerox uh, was one of the very early companies that really looked for a diverse workforce. It's yeah, the small companies. Three guys get together in their dorm room, and you know, no, you can't just sort of say, "We'll hire this woman." But when they get larger, they need to start thinking about this much earlier than they typically do. Hmm. It's interesting. You know, I mean, and, I mean, in general, I think companies focus way too much on finding people with, you know, we want someone who's got five years experience programming Java or something, rather than we're willing to make the effort to train people. We're, we're not going to you know, go find random people on the subway, but we're going to look for smart people and then help them rise to the job. I mean, I have a personal little thing I like to say, which is never take a job for which you're already qualified. Yeah. Huh. That's actually um, uh, interesting. It's great, but the challenge is companies need to be willing to take people who are, who are capable but not yet qualified and help them learn on the job, train them, develop them, motivate them, and not simply say, you know, well, I'm looking for somebody who's from a minority group that has 10 years of experience doing something. It's like, no, go out and find some people who have the capacity to do this and then help them do it. And you will, you know, you will have created real value in the world. And just to great employees who will be loyal. Just to reiterate what you just said, um, never take a job you're qualified or specifically, so you can actually grow into a, new, in, into a more defined role, or can you just reiterate on that? Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's like you will meet a dark, handsome stranger. Sometimes this is not totally good advice, but it sounds better when you say, never take a job for which you are already qualified. Yeah. Already because when you say for which you are already qualified, there's this sort of intimation that you will become qualified. You're just not already qualified. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, and again, on the other side, the company has to be willing to train people rather than asking for them to be ready made. <laughs> Almost like a, a cookie cutter, essentially. What, yeah. are, what are, I mean, resources are obviously uh, very little in small companies, um, as well as big companies. I mean, budgets are always being slashed. How, how can, what are some examples of better training programs or better training initiatives that you found or other companies have found? So founders like me, but a small company can also you know, implement those to make our employees better. Um. I mean, one is sending your employees to meetups or, that are focusing on the kinds of skills or, or areas that your employees are involved in. Um, you know, paying for real live training courses. There's lots of online courses that are very valuable. Uh, and I mean, starting with having your your leaders be good managers, not just great techies, but people who motivate and manage and encourage people. Mm -hmm. I'm just writing down the, 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 the part where, you know, there, there's no perfect individual out there. Um, there's no perfect individual out there for hiring and, and you should be willing to you know, go out of your way a little bit just to help them out and, you know, teach them the skills that they need. You're not, um, you're not helping them out. You're investing in them. You're investing in them. Yeah, I mean, there's a real difference. You're not doing it out of charity. You're doing it because you want well-trained employees and you're investing in training them. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's a, a wonderful joke. <laughs> Guy goes to a board meeting and this is the CEO. He put $10 million into a new project that was run by this other guy. And yes, they're both guys because it's statistically the case. So the guy who, who spent the 10 million on the new market and failed 
the board says, well, of course you're going to fire him, right? And the CEO says, no way. I just spent 10 million investing in his education. Now he knows something. And wow. that is the attitude you need to take. I mean, if somebody did something stupid or right. immoral, that's different. But if, if they did something that didn't work out, but they learned from it, you know, boy, that's a valuable employee because think how much better they'll do it the next time. And as an investor, I've several times invested in people who lost me money the first time around because I thought they were ethical. I thought they learned a lot. I believed in what they were doing. It failed. But, you know, I invest in them once and I know them and I now trust them. And yeah, why not invest again? I mean, there are other people who've lost me money I would never invest in again. But, you know, just, just having lost money one time doesn't mean they will again. It often means they've learned a lot. People who fail and learn are way more capable. That's actually yeah. a very humble thing to say. I mean, I'd say are often more capable. Are often more capable. Okay. Yeah, or you could say some people who fail and learn. I mean, you know, again, I'm, I'm very leery of saying any particular piece of advice is always true. Right, and there's always a caveat to that, right? Any yeah. situation is given your, uh, yeah. you know, your amount of resources you have, the kinds of investors you have. Um, it's actually, again, it's very humble of you saying that because I know a lot of investors in the community who would, especially not, in, especially in overseas communities where the, you know, t you know, entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial community is just developing. It's very hard for an entrepreneur to fail and come back again. Unfortunately, right. it's very hard, and we live in a country which you know, we. Are a little bit more open-minded given our history of you know coming across the water and you know building our own little startup here called the yeah. USA. I think uh, I think a lot of that you know goes back then. The last thing I want to talk about is space. Now it's it's very it's, it's a very interesting topic for me personally, and I know it's for you as well. What are, what do you think about the the public com the private companies like SpaceX and you know Blue Origin, a bunch of other companies? What is your opinion on on where our space commerce or space industry is going, and and at what point can you know more and more people get involved um, into that? Well, you can get involved now. I mean, there's not everybody in space is an astronaut or Elon Musk. There are lots of engineers. There are people you know who do space training for astronauts or space tourists. There are people who build engines. There are people who work on three D printers. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a big source of jobs and not just for astronauts. I think that's sort of the first thing. It's, there's a lot of technical sides to it, but, you know, XCOR has a CFO, so does SpaceX. There's, there are other ways to get involved in space than being the space expert or the space guru. Personally, you know, I want to retire on Mars because I think it will be much more comfortable, but not very soon. <laughs> and... The biggest challenge in the space industry right now is there's a real shortage of management. You know, there's there's a lot of engineers, and at the same time, just like in tech, there aren't that many good managers, and so that's a challenge. What are some so education is definitely one of the most important things in order to move society forward. Is Singularity University the only good example of a forward way of thinking in terms of providing education? Or what are some other venues of getting that education so that people can get involved in this industry and become better managers? Or um, wait, I'm sorry. Are we still talking about space or are we talking about education in general? I'm talking about what are some ways of, of educating uh, college students or even high school students to get involved in these and in space itself, uh, are there some space focused initiatives going on that they can yeah, get involved I mean, with? All kinds of universities and colleges have courses in engineering, in propulsion, in astronomy. Um, you know, there's the International Space University, but, but fundamentally, as I was saying earlier, you don't need to be an astronaut or a Singularity University graduate to get involved in space. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and the last thing we, I'd love to touch I mean, base just, on. Just look at who SpaceX has hired. Um, a I lot mean, of, I think, yeah. a lot of NASA, NASA graduates. A lot of NASA people, but also a lot of 
just engineers, a lot of managers, a lot of mechanics, a lot of hydraulics experts. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real enterprise. It's, it's not just a vision. The talent really does come from all kinds of backgrounds and yeah. industry. I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think curiosity is definitely one of those interesting uh, elements to hiring someone. If they show more curiosity, they tend to do better or, or, or are they, in your opinion, are they better candidates um, than someone who's just more qualified? Yeah, I mean, curiosity is, you know, back when Xerox was hiring, Curiosity was good for Xerox. I mean, it's it's not peculiar space. Mm -hmm. Curiosity mm -hmm. means understanding, being wanting to know how things work, wanting to improve them. Um, you know, just being willing to ask questions rather than just. You know, one of the biggest problems was ultimately the Challenger and the Columbia accident accidents were due to people who were afraid to ask questions within NASA. I mean, they, if you read the reports on those two accidents, it was a culture problem. It was not a technical, you know, it was a culture that let known technical problems yeah. fester. That is, that's, yeah. Well, the last thing I do want to touch base on, especially for um, our community, is any pieces of advice you would give to a young entrepreneur in high school or in college um, me specifically, I mean, I started off yeah. very young uh, high school and I've been in touch with you uh, since the very early days of, of college itself uh, on and off. What are, what, what would you, what is the one piece of advice you'd give to the younger 16 year old Esther? Don't false, don't focus on being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. you know, get over it. You're not so special. Don't focus on what you want to be. Focus on what you want to do. What interests you? What are you curious about? And how can you best achieve that? It may be going to work for SpaceX for three years and then starting your own company. It may be going to work for some software company down the street and learning how to be a great manager. It's, it's not necessarily going out and starting something. It may be, I mean, especially in healthcare and health where I spend a lot of time, you know, understand what you're trying to disrupt. Because otherwise, you're going to go out and do a lot of stupid things because you don't understand the environment that you're working in. So you're much better off getting a job in the area that interests you. And then you'll figure out not just what people are doing wrong, but how to get them to do it right. Because somebody coming from college and telling them, you're doing this wrong, you should do it this way, is not going to get a lot of buy in. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like, I really think nine times out of 10, Peter Thiel is wrong. You shouldn't drop out of college. You know, every once in a while, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg did, and it turned out pretty well. But most people who drop out of college do not turn into Mark Zuckerberg. And so looking at those individual anecdotes mm -hmm. really blinds people to the statistics. It's interesting. Um, I was just reading the article about Peter Thiel uh, in, in recently about his whole philosophy of, you know, dropping out and whatnot. And some, some of my friends have actually done that as well. But they've actually gone back to yeah. you know, get more about specific industries, subsequently drop out again, but they actually took that education to build a better and more powerful company. Yeah. Um, Esther, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on our, our fireside chat uh, with a real fireplace. Um, it's been an honor having you on, on our show. Yes. Um, and I definitely think our audience of entrepreneurs and creatives uh, will, will, will take a lot of your advice to heart um, and implement it in their businesses as well. Great. Thank I, you. Thank and you. thanks for the fireplace. It's gorgeous. Yeah, our whole, our whole uh, our thing is, our whole motto is to make sure our speakers and people feel cozy and warm yeah. um, and that we have an intellectual conversation around a you know, fireplace or something like that. So that's my... That's my corny, uh, corny thing about having fireplaces in the background. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. I'll see you soon in New York. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.